Oh, there we got sound. There we go. Well, y'all keep this. What's this? Think this protects you? Is that it? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it's good to be back home at uh, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. And just so you know, we didn't lose a dime out there. We didn't. Uh, of course, that helps if you don't actually play in the casinos. You actually don't lose money, so it's a good thing. So we stayed away from there. And um, but it was uh, quite a trip. And uh, made a lot of new friends out there. We got some new contacts and new representatives for the area. We had, I think it was a DHT, and we had 34 states and three different nations represented. So uh, it, it had a good turnout, and uh, some good testimonies come back from there. So we'll be sharing some of those. I'm getting them written up so we can share them correctly. I do want to make some announcements real quick before we actually get started. Number one, <clears throat> some homeless assistance. We are collecting blankets and probably coats or anything else. I believe uh, John David is overseeing this outreach. They go down, and these aren't just going out just to give out things, and people are not just looking for free handouts. They're actually uh, they, now they, John David and, and the team has been going down there for some time, so now they actually bring people for prayer, and the homeless people are bringing other homeless people in for prayer. So uh, we'll be collecting blankets and probably anything else that uh, you want to bring in. So if you want to bring that either to the church during next week or uh, to church next Sunday, then immediately after service next Sunday, they're going to gather together and go down and minister to the homeless and take some of the blankets and things to them. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, where is, well, are y'all meeting this afternoon or right after service? They're meeting right after service. So if you're, if you're interested in <clears throat> helping out with the homeless assistance, then uh, just talk to John and David at the after service and they're all going to gather up and talk about it a little bit so uh, talk to them uh, does everybody know who John David is John you want to there you go so if you know him talk to him and uh, we'll be glad to help out we are going to try to find a room here that's not being used which I have no idea where that would be but uh, we're going to try to find a place that we can start storing some things for uh, different outreaches both clothes, clothing uh, food pantry the whole thing so anything you want to bring in being that it's uh, going to start getting a little bit cooler here. Uh, obviously, coats and blankets and anything like that that can help. Anything you want to donate to it, just bring it in, and we will set it aside to be taken out. So uh, we would definitely want to participate in this, so I would highly encourage everybody to get involved. Now, uh, secondly, we got new bookmarks. Or if you've seen these or not, they're on the table back there. Uh, this is actually we did this from the diversities of tongues seminar and it just says on one side diversities of tongues the dynamo of dunamis and it says I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all first Corinthians 14 18 and then on the other side it says have you spoken in tongues today so it pushes you all right so we want to remind you so we got some back there on the table so if you want to grab some of those on your way out feel free they are free so you can Take what you need there and um, take a couple to give out if you need to or if you know some people that need bookmarks. I know we don't have any e-bookmarks that we can give you, but uh, I know everybody's going to e-books now. So. To me, that's a shame. There's nothing to me better much than a good book, the one that you can actually turn the pages. And the older the book it is, the better it is. They have a particular feel and smell. Smell didn't always great, but anyway, the uh, it, it's, <laughs> it, it does remind you that it's an old book. So, we are going to cover what else? What else we got? Yes, <clears throat> cell phones, anything like that. If you would turn those off, turn them down. Uh, <clears throat> we generally have enough disturbance without extra phones going on. So, we're going to cover some things today. Uh, as I said, we were in. Nevada last week. I keep wanting to say Vegas. Technically, it's a suburb, but um, <clears throat> it was uh, an, a very unusual DHT, which they've gotten unusual lately, and uh, it, it went very well. And we were getting into some areas that we don't always get to get into in a lot of the DHTs because we um, a lot of the people there had already been through it online or by CD or DVD, so it was just uh, a lot of people had heard it before, and yet they still came to the meeting and still want to be trained. Personally, so we were able to go a little bit further with them, and <clears throat> there were some things that kept coming up. And so t this morning, I really wanted to focus on one of those because sometimes it's good just to pinpoint 
some of the problem areas. And so I want to make sure that uh, we're very clear uh, about certain points. Just uh, as many people know, um, you know, we don't we don't purposely try to uh, go against whatever current teaching there is. We just try to say what the Bible says, which tends to go against whatever current teaching there is. So uh, we just um, many times as we go as we look at, at different topics. You can have all the teaching in certain areas, and it can be right, and yet if you have a couple of areas that are off, it just kind of throws everything else off, and it makes it where you're not quite as effective. So we want to be effective in everything that we do, and so we want to be fruitful to every good work, as the Bible says we should be. So we're going to touch on some things today. Um, I have a quote here, a couple of things. Uh, As all of you would probably know, uh, last Tuesday was Election Day. And it seems that there were 120 million votes cast at a 315 million population. Now, obviously, a lot of the population can't vote, but there were only 90 million voting in 2008. So quite an increase, over 30 million increase. And then, of course, a quote by Aesop. Anybody know who Aesop was? Remember? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, He said... We hang the petty thieves and appoint the great ones to public office. So, just thought, uh, <laughs> if you have an election going on, you automatically think of that stuff. So, anyway. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of things today. Uh, actually, you don't have to have a DHT manual, but I'm actually just working right out of a chapter out of it. So, if you have a manual, you can follow along. I doubt if you brought it with you. But... Uh, if you do, it's section 16, page 117 in the manual. If not, you can go to Psalm 32. While you're going there, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we bless you that we, that we woke up this morning alive, full of life, ready to serve you, ready to know your will, and to accomplish your will. So, Father, we thank you that as we speak, your words will come forth, your will will be accomplished, our eyes will be opened and enlightened. And, Father, that by the time we finish... Our one prayer is that we will be more like your son, Jesus. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Psalm 32. Now, and this is even under the Old Covenant. And and, and here in the next couple of weeks, I'll probably be teaching more about the Old and New Covenant because I want to make sure that everybody's well-grounded. And a lot of people just don't think about it a lot of times, but we are in the new covenant, we're not in the old covenant. And so, we want to talk about these, and and under the old covenant, there were specific things and specific ways that people ministered, but in the new covenant, it's vastly different. Uh, Basically, under the old covenant, God had to more or less impose his will on people by his spirit in many ways, and in the New Testament, he infuses us with his will. So it's a different, it's not an imposition, but it's an infusing. And so instead of him just leading people along blindly, so to speak, he actually puts his will in us. In Philippians 2.13, he tells us that it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now see, you might want to write that down, Philippians 2.13. That's a key scripture for the new covenant, that it is God who is at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, even the desire in you, when you get born again, his spirit dwells in you. And as soon as his spirit comes into you, he starts to influence you. Matter of fact, if you look at the word uh, filled in the New Testament, in the Greek, it originally, what it means very simply is to be influenced. If a person is filled with anger, they are influenced by their anger to the point where they act. They say something, they do something, or something happens. And so uh, there's an aspect of being filled that has to do with influence. Well, it's the same thing when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, being born again, then there is an influence that takes place. Now, a lot of times, and and I'm not sure we'll be able to get into this scripture today. I don't even know if I have it here listed. But the scripture says that we are, that before we were saved... We were, my mic's working good. Make sure that's off. No, I meant that one. There we go. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Make sure I wasn't bleeping out there. They, um, it is very clear that before we were saved, 
were influenced by what the Bible calls our father at that time, which was the point where it became our nature. And that nature is based on selfishness, basically. That's the easiest way to say it. It is based on fear. It's based on selfishness. It is the whole basis is that the satanic nature of fallen man was so had so permeated humanity that people did whatever they wanted to do and it wasn't even the devil having to make them do it, it was because they had the same nature the devil had do you understand that is that pretty simple right so we we understand that and we we look at people and many times people say well you know well the devil made me do that well the devil really doesn't make you do anything he he finds areas you like to do and he works with you in that area and so he tempts you in areas, and usually temptations come in the area that, of things that you tend to like. So that's why it's so important that as a Christian, when we come to Christ, that we learn what it means to die so that we don't like those things. It's like I tell people, you know, I, I, I drink all I want to, I smoke all I want to, I do all I want, and I don't do any of them. Why? Because I don't want to. Why? Because I have a different nature. And now, <clears throat> when I was younger... Uh, I've never tasted alcohol or, or smoked cigarettes or any of that stuff or drugs or anything else. But it wasn't, I had to work against it. But when I was a child, I made a vow when I was nine years old that I would never do that. And that vow helped me keep strong in that. And even whenever I was in my 20s and in the nightclubs, people would offer to buy me drinks or anything else and try to hand me other things, either drink or smoke. And, it, you know, I would take it and hand it to somebody else. Why? Because it just never even tempted me. I was never tempted to partake of it. You say, well, you know, why is that? I, I don't know other than the fact that I made that vow when I was nine, and it just got so ingrained in me. Now, another aspect was that I was involved in, uh, well, martial arts, exercise, working out, that kind of thing, and I was pretty uh, adamant about developing my body, and I had heard all the damage that these other things did, so that was another reason. But essentially, your nature is the nature of whosoever you are the son of. And so, and it's funny because as, a, as an unsaved person, we know that sinners are sinners by nature. They sin by nature. They don't have to be really tempted to sin. It's part of their nature. And so, many times we look at that, and, and even the Apostle Paul said that whenever you were uh, unsaved, and he, actually he, he didn't use those words, but what he was saying was that there was a time whenever you were led away to these false gods that were not gods but were actually devils and he said and you followed them and you were led astray unto them and the way you were led was by the nature of the spirit that you were following or a part of so it became natural to you now you know I don't know of too many people that before they were saved back whenever they were unsaved that you know on Friday evening they would say well you know what are you going to do this evening well I'm not sure but I think well, I, I, I don't know. I, I know what I'd like to do. I'm going to go home and pray and see if the devil would let me go out and get drunk tonight. I'm not sure, but I hope he'll. I hope he will lead me to get drunk. And to, see, we don't even think that way. We, we say that sounds stupid. Well, but essentially, it's that same mindset that we have with God. That we think we have to get permission from God or be led by God to do what's right. And essentially, we are told to do what's right. We're told to know His will. We are told to do His will. We don't have to be led to do His will. Now, and I want to specify this. And what I mean by this is, is very simple. There is what we call being led by the Spirit. Technically, we even say it right sometimes. We'll say, well, there are, there are special leadings. And those special leadings are whenever God, you know, we're, we're somewhere and all of a sudden we get this, what we would call an impression or something to go do something, you know, in a, in a special way. You're at Walmart, you're shopping, and you just get the... The impression to, to, well, I don't know, but let's just go over this way. And you go over that way, and then you see this person, and you know that you're supposed to pray for that person or something. And those are basically special leadings. Now, even the terminology that we have in the church, special leadings prove to us that that's not the normal leading. And usually, I'm just going to be real blunt, usually the reason you have special leadings is because you're not doing the normal leadings. If you were doing the normal leading, you wouldn't have to be specially led. Right? Now, Again, I'm going to explain all this as we go along, but I want you to realize that whenever you were unsaved, you were led by the nature of the devil. 
being saved, you should be led by the nature of your father. It is that simple. In other words, he shouldn't have to, to specifically tell you, go here and do that, or go here and do this, or pray for this person, or pray for that person. Now, if it's something you can't see, and that person uh, you know, needs help, then yeah, he can tell you that, to pray for this person. But if, it, if it's something you can see, if a person has a need, whether it's physical, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, when I say physical, I'm talking about sickness or disease, or whether it's physical in the sense of just needing help. You know, they need food, they need clothing. Like that. The, the Holy Spirit should never have to purposely, specially lead you to do that. It should be part of your nature. One, because it, it is your Father's nature to give freely and, to, and by the way, this is not a money sermon. Just let me squash that right from the beginning, okay? We're not talking about finances here, especially about giving into the church or anything like that, all right? I'm talking about as you're in your daily life. I'm talking about you touching lives and helping people, right? And what I'm saying now, the Holy Spirit is always there. And what I want you to realize is that your desire, when you see someone, your desire to help that person, it is you, but it's also the Spirit of God. Why? Because your nature has been changed into his nature. Now you both have the same nature. And because of that, that desire, even though it's a godly desire, and in us, there is, as humans, there is no good thing. But in us, in Christ, all things are made new and all things are of God. So even the very desire to do something literally comes from God. So in that sense, you could say that whenever you have a feeling a desire to help somebody, that that is God leading you to do it. And people say, well, yeah, but what if it doesn't work out the way? There's a lot of things that God did that didn't work out the way you would think it would work out. Why? Because God is a God that gives people free will. And he is good to all mankind. He is always good. He makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And so he makes good things happen to all people. And yet at the same time, many people do not respond in the way he would like them to respond to it. And so there is that aspect in us where we start to, to recognize that the desire within us to will and to do his good work is him in us doing that. Now, because of it, that is a leading, but, but it's so general that most people really never pick up on it. They, never, they just think, well, is that just me? You know, is that, is that just, should I do that? Or, you know, Holy Spirit, should I? You know, that is God. That is God in you. Now, Again, the idea of, well, is that just me or is that God? That you should become, and technically you are in the spirit, but you should become, even in the soul, so united to God that you can't tell a difference. If somebody says, was that you or is that God? You say, yes. Why? Because you're one with him. Now, uh, if you have your Bible, you can, I know I have to send you to Psalm 32. We'll go there in a minute. But just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want you to see this. This is where we start. Kind of gives you an idea of it. Just so that you realize kind of where we're coming from from the very basis. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse... We could actually go back to verse 15. Verse 15 says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ... Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. That's out of Genesis chapter 2. Then he said in verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now the idea here, and, and many times we have this conception that you have our spirit and the Holy Spirit and he's communicating over to us and we don't realize that when we get born again it's no longer two but one and that one becomes fused together with the spirit of God with our spirit so that our spirit and his spirit become one now in that whenever he gets an unction so to speak we get the unction whenever he desires to do something we desire to do something that's one of the things that really, um, I used to say, irks me about a lot of Christianity. It's just that how people act about it is that God will be pressing them to do something, and they constantly question whether it's God whenever it's not a question of ethics or morality or, or you know, whether it's even right or wrong. 
They will, they will question God. Oh, feed the hungry? God, is that really you want me to feed the hungry? I mean, is it, or is that just me? What, let me ask you this. What difference does it make? The person's hungry. You can feed them. If you can, feed them. And that's simple. I mean, I would much rather get to heaven, stand before God, and him say, you know that hungry person, I really wasn't, I, I did not intend you to feed him, but you did it anyway. I mean, do you really think that's going to happen? Right? I don't think so. But even if it did, that'd be better than him saying, man, I kept pushing on you, I kept showing, he kept part, and you just never did it. So there comes a point where we just have to give in to the idea that God is working in us. It's God working in us to want to do these things. So let's, let's look at, at some specifics of being led. And again, I told you to go to Psalm 32. Let's go there quickly. Because I, I want to show you this. If, when I got a hold of this, I was brought up in certain circles where, you know, in one one side it was totally natural. In other words, you just do what's right. That was kind of in my early Southern Baptist upbringing. You know, you witness to anybody, you witness to everybody. It doesn't matter, and you don't have to be led to do it. You just do it, right? And then if God specifically leads you to do it, definitely do it, because the way I was taught was, you know, if you're if He specifically specifically leads you to witness to somebody and you don't, that was part of their last chance and they're going to die and go to hell and it's going to be on you. I mean, that was, I know, a lot of guilt there, I know. And the, you know, the, the Baptists were just that far from the Catholic in guilt, you know, when it came to that stuff. But on the other hand, it was very big about just, you know, just, it was very natural. In other words, there was really not a lot of power involved. And when it came to healing, it was pretty much, we'll pay your doctor bill. I mean, that was kind of the mentality. You know, we'll pray for you and we'll pray for, the, for the, you know, God to direct the doctor's hands and we might be able to pay, help you pay your doctor bill, but as far as just God healing, do we, you know, God could if he wanted to, we just wasn't sure if he wanted to, and he might be trying to make something, you know, a better person out of you. You know, there's all these little things that come in. Well, then I got from that over into charismatic Christianity, and everything was, oh, don't do anything unless God leads you. Don't do, don't do anything. You wait until you get that leading. You don't witness unless God leads you to do it. You don't pray for somebody unless God leads you. And I'll admit, that was an extreme, but it was out there. And, I, and it wasn't so much that it came from the pulpits, but it's how the people picked it up, which many times I think was more because they wanted to dodge their responsibility. And so they kept saying, well, I just don't feel led to do that. Well, we're all going to go witnessing next week. You wanna, no, I just don't feel led. Okay, if you don't feel led to witness, you're probably not saved. Amen. Right? Is that clear enough? That's just throwing that out there. All right? <laughs> you don't get too excited now. All right, now. Let's <laughs> don't have anybody waving any handkerchiefs at me. So... I'm trying to work you up there. Okay, no. Psalm 32. We're actually going to get there. And, and again, this is under the Old Covenant. So this is how God was talking to them then. He said, this is what I want to do. In verse 8. All right, go back to verse... Uh, you know what? Let's see. I don't want to go read the whole thing. Um, let's go to verse 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now verse 8, this is what I was getting to. I, this is God talking to me. He said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with mine eye. You see that? He said, I will teach you. I will instruct you, I'll teach you in the way you should go. Now, to, if you have to be taught and instructed in the way to go, it means that he's not always going to tell you which choice to make. He's teaching you which way to go and for you to walk in that way. You get that? Now, again, let me be clear. If God gives you a specific leading or an impulse or impression or whatever you want to call it to do a specific thing at a specific time, do it. Especially if you know it's God. Now, even if you question it's God, many times you can still do it, and it'll still work out good, right? And if you believe it's God and you do it, and even if it wasn't God, God will give you credit for doing it. Why? Because he's a good God, right? You believed you were doing what you're supposed to do. You believed you were being obedient, and he will credit you for that. Now, so don't think you're going to do something and it's going to be forgotten or you're just wasting whatever it is you did because nothing is wasted. God doesn't miss a thing, right? Next, Notice he said, I will guide you with mine eye. Now, think about that. I will guide you with my eye. Now, if you go back to the, to the original Hebrew, it says the same thing. 
but it does, if you bring it out a little bit and go in and study the words, it's kind of neat. Because what he says is, you will see things the way I see them. Now think about that. If he's going to guide you with his eye because you see things the way he sees them, and that's how he's going to guide you, then obviously he's going to give you the, the feelings, if you want to call it that, the impressions, the, the emotions, or whatever it is, to do whatever it is you see. So when you see a person that's hungry or sick or whatever the case may be, and you have that natural, when I say natural, I'm talking about for a Christian, that what is part of your nature, you have that impulse in you to do something, that is God letting you see the way he would do it. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, I only do what I see my Father do. This is exactly what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about he was saw the Father come down and lay his hands on a blind man. and he, he, didn't, he didn't see that. What he saw was, this is what my Father would do. And he said, I'm seeing this person through my Father's eyes. And so I'm going to do what my Father would do if he were here. And so if, if he sees through his Father's eyes and he has that same emotional draw then he accepted the fact that that was God in him working through to accomplish what he was supposed to do. See, so God wants us to be one with him. He wants us to be connected with him. He wants us to, to, to have the same feelings. You know, I've said it before, even in the, in the divine healing technician training, God could have done a lot of things differently. He could have healed people differently. He could heal people differently today. There is a reason why he wants and, and has specified that the one main way to see the sick healed is to lay hands on the sick. And people say, well, why does he do that? Well, number one, it's a sign. You're there. You lay hands on them. They get healed. They say, how do you do that? You say, Jesus in me, my heavenly Father, gave me the ability to do this. Right. So it's a sign to them right then that you are connected to God. But that's only on that side. On your side. See, God never does anything on one level. He, have you ever seen that nine-level chess, a nine-level chess game? That's amazing. And they have different players on each thing, and you're having a, you know, mind-boggling. But people that can play nine-level chess, brilliant minds, all right? I can't play it, just to let you know. I'm not saying that because I can play it. I can't. I have no clue. I like chess on one level, all right? <laughs> so, and I have a rough time thinking three moves ahead anyway. But... A person that can play nine-level chess is brilliant because they have to be able to see interdimensionally. That's the way God does. He never does anything on one dimension. Everything he does has four different aspects and helps everybody involved. It doesn't help just one person. It helps everybody. So whenever he decreed that we are to heal the sick by laying our hands on the sick. It wasn't just so they get healed. It wasn't just so that they know we're connected to God and that it's God doing it. It's also for us. Because there's only two times when you get to feel what God feels. One of those is whenever you're a, a brand new parent. Right when, you have, right when that baby is first born, you have a feeling as a parent that you created this life and how and all that responsibility is there and all that love for it and everything is right there and yet at that very moment you know that that life is totally dependent on you and yet you and there's a, a sense of feeling that nothing else is like and that's what and the reason we have that is because that's what God feels toward us that he created this life and that he is responsible for it and he will take care of it but he had that, that feeling to be able to create life comes from God and then the second time is when you lay hands on the sick and someone gets healed and you watch their body change or you, you see them being healed. For that split second that that's going on, and especially afterwards when you're contemplating it or thinking about it a little bit, you have that absolute sense of awe of what it feels like to heal the sick and watch that body change. Not that you did it in and of yourself, but that God was working through you, but you get to feel what God feels when that person is healed. And there is no other feeling like it. That, that all of a sudden this person was, Satan had this plan for their life. And then because God came into that person's life through you, now all of a sudden their entire life has changed. Satan's plans are changed. All of his plans for them is completely destroyed. And their entire life is absolutely changed. And so you get to feel what God felt. That's what God wants. He wants us to not only know him, and to think Christianity has become so cerebral 
It's become so intellectual. And, and there's aspects, obviously, there's knowledge and things like that that are important. There's information that's important. But it goes beyond just what we can think. And it goes beyond what, how we figure things out. That there's an absolute union. And the closest union, Paul used this, this, this uh, illustration. He said that when a, when, when a person is joined to God, there are one spirit with God. And he says just as two people being two become, are no longer two but become one flesh. Well, there are always two people. But yet, they become one entity. That's what God wants. There, there'll always be God, and then there'll always be you. But there is such a point where there is such a union that you become a new entity. And that new entity knows and relates with God so that, you know, if you're married, just being with the person you're married to, just being with them, many times is more important than anything that can be said. They're just spending, you know, time uh, together. You know, no matter what you're doing, it's more important than what you're saying or even what you're doing. It's the fact that you're together. That's what God wants. That is what God was, was really aiming for, with, even with Adam. And definitely aiming for whenever he brought Jesus into the world. Why? Because he wants us to have that union so that it doesn't matter what we're doing. It's the fact that we're doing it with God in our life. That that makes a difference. That makes everything change. It makes everything good. Now... Again, I, I want to get back into this. In Psalm 32, verse 8 there, he says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. In other words, you will see things the way I see them, and therefore he's taught you the way to go, so you'll see things the way I see them, God said, and therefore I want, I want you to walk in that way and do what I would do if I was there. That's all he's talking about. And, that, and again, even that was under the old covenant. Then look at verse 9. And this is kind of cinches it for me. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. So now it's important to have understanding. Why? Well, he's going to teach you in the way that you're supposed to walk. He's going to instruct you and guide you, right? Whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Now what he's saying is, don't be like the horse or the mule that has to have a bridle in your mouth and has to be led and pulled aside. He's, he's saying, I don't want to have to specially lead you. I want to be part of you. I want, to, I want to be with you to the point where you walk in the way that I've taught you. I want you to see things the way I see them. I want us to be one in nature and in purpose. Even Jesus said at one point, he said, if you will lay down your life and take up my life. And again, going back in the original Greek, the Greek is always more full and more pointed. And there, it, it goes much further. He said, if you will lay down your low life with your low ambitions, your low objectives, you know, your low purposes and take on my higher life with my high ambitions and my high objectives. And we was talking about ambitions. He wasn't talking about jobs and things like that. He was talking about his ambition, which is to know God and to make him known and to actually walk with God and to actually bring God into this world. Because essentially the only entrance God has into this world is through his body. And so that's what he is waiting for, is for us to begin to be his body and act like him and see things the way he sees them. And yet, and, and not be, I'm going to go beyond, okay, you've got, in my mind, or I, I, I'll, maybe I just need to define that first. You've got Christian, but then you've also got heathen, which are just sinners, okay? Heathen, just sinners, don't love God, maybe don't even know anything about God. Then you've got pagan, right? Pagan is is religious without God. Right? You understand what I mean by that? It's false religions. It's, it's you know, witchcraft. It's, you know, just, uh, you, you name it. The, the God of the Amorites and the Canaanites and all of the, the even those gods. In, but even nowadays, it's just, so, uh, it's being very religious with the wrong spirit. And we, the church now, is not so much Christian. It's more pagan. Why? Because we're ultra-religious. And we, we still have this idea that we have to appease this bloodthirsty God and that we always have to make sure that we're just really not making him mad. And we, do, we just walk real softly to make sure we don't just make him mad because any second he could get mad. And if he gets mad enough just to get at us, he'll wipe out our city just to get at one person. And I, uh, you know, we, we would say, well, of course that's not. Believe it or not, people think that way. You would be surprised how much flack I catch 
from people that say, well, you can't say that, that God didn't send Katrina to wipe out New Orleans. I said, yes, I can, and yes, I do. That was not God, right? That was the devil trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And then people say these different things, you know, the Hurricane Sandy up in, in New York in that area. That was not God, right? Now, Jesus may have predicted some of these things, but just being, I, I want to hit this, just because Jesus predicted or prophesied something doesn't mean it's his will. It just means he knows about it. You get that? Doesn't mean he sent it. And if you read Matthew 24, Matthew 25 and those areas, it, it talks about the end of days and the end of times and what's going on in times. And, and it talks about the beginning of sorrows. And he talks about the women being in birth pangs and that, they, that these birth pangs will get sharper and stronger and closer together. Right? You say, do you believe we're in that time? Yeah, I believe that time started 2,000 years ago. Why? Because we're in the last days as of 2,000 years ago because of what Peter said. And so, you know, you say, well, how close do you think it is? Have no idea. And honestly, don't care. What matters to me is that whenever he comes, I'm right with him, walking with him, and helping as many people as I can to walk with him. Right? To me, that's all that counts. I don't care. If, you know, if God said, do you, if he came to me and stood me face to face and said, do you want to know when you're going to die? I would say, nope don't want to. Why? Because I would not want to think in changing anything. Right now, if he showed up today and said, tomorrow, guess what? You're out of here. I wouldn't change a thing. There is nothing I would change. Why? Because God is good. He's just. He's going to do what's right. And I'm walking with him. And you say, you mean you're, you're, you're perfect? You don't make mistakes? Never said that. Never said that. But I do know this. My heart toward God is right. My mistakes are mistakes. Right? You get that? They're mistakes. So it's, they're not planned. They're not purposeful. There's nothing. There's no willful sin in my life, nothing like that. I'm, I'm walking with God, right? Now, I'll, I'll admit, uh, you know, just being very blunt with you, there are things I look at that I'm still balancing out, you know, that I'm still figuring out, put it that way. Now, the overall plan, the overall walk with God, that's pretty simple. Certain things I look at, and especially in today's uh, Christian world, we have... Uh, you know, the ultra grace, and then we have ultra law. You know, we have, and, and then we have everything in between. And there's degrees of, of people say, well, what about this? What about that? And, you know, there, and uh, actually I'll be talking about this in probably the next couple of weeks because I want to bring out where does law come in? Where does grace come in? How does it work? People say, well, it's all grace and no law. Okay, that sounds good, but that doesn't answer the question. And really we have to get down to the very nuts and bolts, as we'd say, and, and talk about some of these things because if it is, as some people would say, then even governments don't have a right to punish wrongdoers if you take the, the extreme position, right? And, and technically, well, I'm going to sound like I'm getting right into it right now. I'm not going to go there today, right? But there are degrees and there are, there are aspects of this that we have to look at. So, again, today we're talking about us following God, us walking with God, knowing His will. Now, this is, and again... I don't see what all the hubbub about this is in the church. But people are so uptight and, and like they're walking a tightrope. And it's not like that at all. You know? Now, I'm not saying the way is broad, okay? Because the Bible said very clearly it's narrow. And Jesus is that narrow way. But now, the key is to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. Just as I spoke, I believe, the last time I, I ministered a couple of weeks ago. And so there is that aspect. We have to make sure that we are where we're supposed to be. And that we are right with God. Now, let's let's move on here. Notice at the end there he said, Be not as a horse or as a mule that have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle lest they come near unto thee. He does not want to have to pull your head. He doesn't... Now, do you get the importance of this scripture? He does not want... He's, he doesn't want to be a horseman sitting on your back with a, with a bridle and the reins in his hand having to pull you from side to side. He wants you to work with him. I'm, you know, here we're in Texas. I was raised, uh, well, mostly in my life over here in Mesquite. I rode bulls to Mesquite Rodeo at, at uh, up in Blue Ridge and Royce City when I was a kid. We were up in Blue Ridge this weekend, and I found the rodeo arena we used to go riding in and, and ride bulls in. And there are a few things from a cowboy perspective, all right, and I don't claim to be a cowboy, but I have a high respect for him, okay? But there are a few things uh, more beautiful to watch than a good cutting horse and a good rider. 
a, a team, a horse and a rider together, working together. And, and if they are a true team and it's a good horse and he's a good rider, he even puts the reins down and he doesn't do a thing. The horse does it and he just works with it. It's amazing to watch how the horse and the rider work together. It sounds like the song I know we used to sing, horse and rider thrown into... Anyway, okay. But <laughs> that was the Egyptian horse and rider. That's not the cowboy horse and rider, right? So, but you watch them work together. That's how God wants to be. He wants to work with you. He wants you to have his mind. He doesn't want to have to tell you what to do. See, it's like, I, that's like with me, with my staff and my kids. I don't want to have to tell them things to do because if I have to tell them then I'm making them do it I want them to want to do it and if you're a parent you know what I'm talking about you want them to want to do certain things and you don't want to have to tell them because once you tell them now you don't know if they're doing it because they want to or because you're telling them to do it well do you think God's any different he's already spoke to us he's given us his will he wants us to want to do what's right he wants us to want to do his will because he doesn't want to have to tell us, do this, now do that. He wants to, us to have it in us to do what's right. He wants to guide us with desire. Isn't that simple? That's the way he wants us to be. This thing is so simple. We always have to go back. Listen, Jesus, as I say all the time, Jesus did not come to institute a new theology. He didn't come to institute a, a new religious system. He came to say, listen, my heavenly Father wants to be one with you. He wants to be united with you. He wants to give you life. He wants your life to be good. Yeah. He, he want, now, good, you know, you have to define good, but he wants your life to be one with him. Not, he doesn't want you to be religious in the sense of following rituals and systems to say, if I do this and check this box and act this way, I know I'm right with God. No, he wants you to realize it is in your nature, if you're right with God, to be doing the, the right boxes without even having to check them. Does that make sense to you? That's the way God wants you to be. Now, and, and most of you, those of you that have been here a while, you, you kind of understand this. And I know apparently, you know, as many times as a minister, I know I'm preaching to those that aren't here, right? And those that are watching by internet or listening by CD or DVD, even in the future. And, but people need to get this. They need to realize that God will tell you specific things, things to do at certain times, but usually it's because we get so busy in life that we, we walk right past a person that needs help. And so he has to get our attention to say, that person, pray for them. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Well, that'd be a special leading, but he would much rather have you aware of people around you so that you see the need and automatically go to it. You know, there is, when we talk about in, um, was it John 5? Yeah, go to John 5 real quick. We'll get right back over into the rest of it here in just a minute. But look at John 5. See, this always, again, once you know, you start seeing this more and more. It's kind of like going to the DHT. How many of y'all have been to the DHT? Been to a divine healing technician training? Okay. Did you notice after the DHT? Now, you were aware of healing before. But after the DHD, have you noticed how many more sick people you see? Have you ever noticed that? All of a sudden, they're everywhere, right? And you think, where'd they all come from? They were there all the time. But what you don't think you can fix or help, you learn to block out. So it makes you wonder how much have we blocked out in other areas. Because we should be able to help any person, anywhere, anytime, for anything. So go to John 5. John 5, chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these, now you notice the word Bethesda means house of God's mercy. Okay, house of God's mercy. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, you notice there, again, I always point this out. It didn't matter who got in, and it didn't matter what they had. When they got in, they got healed. God doesn't care who you are, and he doesn't care what you have. He wants you well. Right? 
not a spe- notice he didn't specify who got in and who got healed because God doesn't have a specific day for you to get healed other than the day that Jesus bore the stripes on the whipping post. That was the day all mankind was healed according to God, right? And today is the day of salvation. You know, it's an old Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today, all right? So... That's kind of the way it is with healing. Well, with healing, the best time for your healing was 2,000 years ago. The second best time is today. Why? Today is a day of salvation. Amen? <clears throat> don't, you don't have to wait. And, and listen, people have dreams, they have visions, they hear voices where they say, God told me that, that I'm going to get healed on such and such date, you know, five years down the road. Okay, I will tell you right now, that isn't God. Now, understand what I mean by that. What I mean by that is this. If God said, you can't be healed until this day, five years down the road, that's not God. Now, I'm not saying that God might not say, it'll be five years before you finally accept it, you hard-headed thing. No, he didn't say that. But anyway, but, okay. <laughs> See, I have to be careful. I'll interpret for him sometimes. He didn't, it doesn't always be the same. So, but there are people sometimes that say well God told me it's going to happen this way or this time in the future and then it happens that when people say yeah see that's what no you believe that and that's when you got it but if you would believe two years ago so the woman that touched the hem of Jesus' garment she was healed because she said within herself if I touch him it was a garment so when she touched him it was a garment it happened why that's what she believed she could have said well you know what I know that if I could get to Jesus I could be healed and if, if I know that, then I know he wants me well. If he wants me well, I can be healed right now. And she'd have got healed before then. Right? But generally people don't think that way, especially back then. So, verse 5. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now watch. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, you hear that? There is nothing here that says God led him to, to heal this man. That's in a, he wouldn't even move by compassion, which is almost always how it says Jesus healed. Here it says, when he saw him lie. In other words, when Jesus saw him, I will guide thee with mine eye. When he saw him, he saw him the way God saw him. It wasn't anything special. It was just the way God saw him. He saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. In other words, knew he had been that way for a long time. He said unto him, Will you be made whole? And you see that? All, all Jesus did was see the man. He didn't even... He didn't, the man didn't call out to him and say, Would you come heal me? He didn't ask him anything. He saw the man, went to him, and said, Do you want to be made whole? And then, of course, the man obviously was a good Christian. Because the first thing he did was start complaining. And that's you know what Christians do. That's the first thing. The first thing. You notice Jesus said, Wilt thou me be made whole? And the impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man. Well, that's a complaint. You want to be made whole? I don't have anybody that can help me. And as a matter of fact, he even starts complaining. And he says, I don't have anybody to help me when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, another steps down in front of me. Not only will they not help me, but they step around me and jump in before me. See, this guy would have been a, a good general church member. First thing, average Christian, right there, right? Just <clears throat> obviously not you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other Christian people. So, all right. Then Jesus said, and then verse eight: Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. Right. But the whole point here is that Jesus saw him, just as he said in Psalm 32, "I will guide thee with mine eye." See, Jesus was led the same way you and I are. Jesus had nothing special in any way that we don't have. In matter of fact, in Philippians, it says that he emptied himself, basically, of all of his godhood. In other words, he acted as a man anointed by the Spirit of God and did whatever a man could do. So the things that people say, well, Jesus healed the sick because he was God. No, he didn't. If that's true, then so were the 12 because they healed the sick. So were the 70 because they healed the sick. So was this other guy who went about casting out devils, and we don't even know what his name was. So Jesus didn't do anything because he was God. He did what he did because God was with him. And we know that from Acts 10, 38. That it said how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed the devil for God was with him. Now, again, let's move on with this quickly here. But I, I wanted you to see 
That's one example of being led by God's eye, right? Now, look at, um, yeah, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to cover a real quick verse. A couple of verses here. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, we've read this many times. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Now, do you realize... Okay, Paul was writing to the Roman church. This is after the cross. Is that right? Remember, always remember who's talking and when they're talking and to whom they're talking. So this is Paul after the cross, at least what I think they said it was about, probably been about 50, almost 50 years after the cross roughly. Close to it, something like that. Yeah, 50 AD, I guess, something like that. Yeah. And so, but now notice he said, therefore, brethren, so he's talking to Christians, We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you, brethren, live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify or kill the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Then verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So in other words, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a child of God. How do you know you're a child of God? Because you're led by the Spirit. And so, see, some people go, but, but I'm not real sure, you know, because it's been a long time since he led me. Okay, well, let's, again, let's go back to Romans 8 and see what he's writing about because Romans 8 is not about you being led to heal the sick or do any other work. Romans 8 is about you killing the deeds of the flesh. And you can do that every day and all day, and the Spirit is always leading you to do that. Right? He says, and in the original Greek it says this, for as many as are being constantly led. Now, see, We are to be constantly led. For as many as are being constantly led by God's Spirit, these are the sons of God. So, someone says, well, you know, I'm not always led. God doesn't always lead me. He's not always leading me. Then what you're saying is you're not born again. God is always at work in you by His Spirit, leading you to mortify the deeds of the flesh, live after the Spirit, do what's right, not go after the flesh, not give in to temptation, not do any of these other things, but to do what is right. His Spirit is always in you, leading you to do these things. So you are constantly being led. You get that? You are constantly being led. And because you're constantly being led to mortify the deeds of flesh, that's the proof, and that's all the proof that you have or need to have to, to prove that you are a child of God. So it's not about being constantly led in the sense that he's always saying, go here, now go there. I've had people come up to me Actually, these were ladies, but I've had men say things that were just as not right. As you can tell, I'm trying to be polite here. Okay? <laughs> but they would come and say, Hi, right, you know, would you pray for me that I would be just so perfectly led by the Spirit that even when I'm washing dishes, He would tell me which dish next to wash? Wow. You know, and I've, I've had, actually, I've had almost identical that on numerous occasions. You know, and I look at them like, uh, here's a revelation. How about the dirty ones? Just wash all the dirty ones, all right? And But people want to be that lit, and they think that's a mark of spirituality. And it's not. If anything, if that was the way God was leading you, it would be a mark of immaturity. Why? Because as a child, you're constantly saying, no, 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 no. Don't touch that. Don't touch Isn't it. Why? Because it's a child. Isn't it right? The older they get, the less you should have to say no or do this. They should start learning to do it automatically. So maturity means having to be told what to do less. And you just do what's right automatically. That's maturity. And I don't know why the church doesn't get that. We go the opposite direction and try to be more, we we try to make it more and more specific whenever, he ought to just be able to tell us, go save the world because gotcha, we're on it and just go do it. Amen. Now, if we need information, we ought to be able to say, I don't understand this. He said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask. I don't get it. How do we do this? Oh, here's how you do that. You know, how, how, do I, how do I do this thing? Or, 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 you know, there may be a time when you're witnessing someone. And maybe that person has been witnessed to a dozen times. And if anything, they're just getting harder toward God. And you say, you know, you walk up to a person and say, you know, I, I, I would really, I just want to share some spiritual truth. I don't want to hear it. I, I don't know that Jesus stuff, really. Okay, just kind of, 
Well, you know what? And then right, you don't even have to say it loud. You don't have to say it out. You can just automatically just think, I need wisdom. And it should be right there. Why? Because Jesus has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. Isn't that right? Justification, all this. So we ought to be able to just think, I need wisdom. And right then, that wisdom say, you know, the reason you really don't want to deal with God is because of this. And you start reading their mail. And all of a sudden, they go, whoa, who, 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 who told you that? God told me that. Well, no, that had to be somebody. Okay, you don't believe that? Well, when you were two, and you start going through the list. You know, why? Well, then that would be specific, right? But that would be for the wisdom that you would need for that situation. But in general, now to go witness, you don't need leading. Now, as you're witnessing, as you're helping somebody, you may need wisdom. You may need a certain thing. You know, a friend of mine, uh, he was always real big on being led by the Spirit in, in the way that he thought it was. And me and him we used to really butt heads a lot. And so, and, and it's kind of funny because he made a point one time. And, and he wasn't doing it on purpose. But he was walking down the, we were, we were walking down the road together. And there was a guy coming. To, well, actually, first off, we started walking. And he just reached down and picked up this rock. And was looking. we're just walking, talking. And he put it in his pocket. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, you notice things, but you don't say anything. And you just think, that's weird. Okay. So we're walking on down. And then this young man starts walking toward us. And we're walking. And I see Bill. And he reaches in his pocket. And he pulls out that rock. And as he walks toward this young man, starts to walk past us. And Bill goes, hey, reaches out and hands this rock to this young man. This man looked at it, I mean, change instantly. And Bill led that guy to Christ. And then we asked him, said, why did you accept Christ because Bill handed you a rock? He said, because two blocks down the road, I said, God, if you're real, have somebody walk up and hand me a rock. Right? Bill said, see? And I'm saying, okay, you got me. They said, okay. You know? I said, but not. that's not always. That's not all the time. So, so but there are situations like that that God will do specific things. And, and see, Bill didn't say, Bill didn't know. Because I talked, I believe me, I questioned him on it. Why did you pick up that rock? What did you feel when you picked it up? What did you hear? How did you know to pick up that rock? He said, I just looked down. It caught my eye. I thought I'd pick it up. He said, I pick it up. He said, I looked at it, put it in my pocket. He said, I said, how would you know to give it to that guy? He said, I, whenever I saw it, I looked at that guy and I just thought, hand him, give him that rock. He said, yeah, I thought it was crazy too. So he didn't even know he was being led. See, that's our problem. We want to know. Why do we want to know we're being led? Okay, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. He's okay. He's, <laughs> he's fixing the air. <laughs> we, um, we don't always, we want to know specifics. We want to know when we're led. That's why a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to go out and lay hands on sick unless I know people are going to get healed. Well, that's because you're a coward. Right? The Bible's very clear. Lay hands on the sick. You've got to be obedient whether you like it or not. Right? And, and what it is, is we don't want a failure. We don't want to, and I'll admit, I don't want a failure either. Why? Because somebody's going to stay sick if we fail. But the, the main reason that we don't want a failure is not because people are going to stay sick, but because we don't want to look stupid, which just means we haven't died yet. So, and I'm not saying that you will have failures because God wants you to die more. All right? That is not truth. But the fact is, God is a nine-level chess player. He will do things on several levels at the same time. Sometimes you may have to die more because somebody gets healed. Right? I don't say it happen often, but there are. I've been around people uh, that when God started working through them and people getting healed, uh, instead of them dying, they came alive themselves and started thinking they were something. And so God's not going to let a person stay sick just to keep you humble. Right? He tells you to humble yourself. And so sometimes somebody will get healed and you'll have that idea of, yeah, yeah, we got this, we, we, we got this thing and, you know, I'm going to be the next Benny Hinn or I'm going to be the next, you know, whoever impresses you. And so automatically that's when you have to die, right? Why? Because God wants that person well. And he used you even though he knew you. He still used you, all right? So let's move on here. He says... In verse 15, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But that's where most Christians are. Most Christians are still in bondage to fear because they're afraid that, they, well, I don't want to move unless God tells me to move because I don't want to make a mistake. And you're still in that bondage. Listen, Christianity is freedom. Christianity has in it freedom. The freedom to act. That's, what, that's all authority is. It's a freedom to act. You have the ability to act. 
on another person's behalf generally. Christianity, there is freedom in it. There's not bondage where, where you got to do everything just perfect or you're just, you know, kicked off into hell. There is, God, is, thank God, he looks on the heart. He knows why you do what you do. And, and even all your good works, you may not get credit for. You say, well, you know, I'm not really after credit. I, I know, but some are. But you might not even get credit for all your good works. Why? Because you didn't do them for the right reason. But the fact is, even the good works still benefited somebody. Right? So in us, we can be led even though we don't know we're being led. You don't always have to know you're being led. So he says, go with me now to John 16. John 16. And I'm just bringing out some points here. I want you to realize being born again, God is at work in your spirit. He leads you. He guides you. He starts working through you. And you don't always have to know it. But in John chapter 16, verse 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now notice, he's going to guide you into all truth. There is not one place where it says he will guide you in what to do. Not one place. Where he says he will guide you specifically of what to do. He says he will guide you into truth. Now once you have truth, now you can go back to Psalm 32. Don't be like the horse or the mule that has to have a bit. He said, but be one with understanding. He said, that's what he said in verse uh, 9. He said, don't be without understanding. You don't want to be like a horse or mule that has to have a bit. Have understanding. He said, I'll guide you with mine eye. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what's right to do. And here he's saying, but the Spirit of God is going to come to dwell in you. And when he does, it's the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth so that you will have an understanding of truth and what you're supposed to walk in. Now, we are to walk in the truth. The Scripture is clear about that. It's not a matter of... He did, think about this. If we were supposed to only be led specifically by the Spirit of God in an instant-by-instant instant basis, we don't need this at all. You get it? Why? Because why? All you, got, all you need is for, by word of mouth, get saved. Once you get saved, now He's in you. Now all you do is what He tells you to do. So you wouldn't need a book at all. Why would you need this? This is not a book of specifics. It's a book of principle. It's a book of truth. He gives you principles. He gives you the truth. And that truth, he guides you into and you walk according to the principles of that truth. You know? Do I have to be told to witness? No, I know it's always right. Does that mean I always do it? Nope. Do I have to be told who to lay hands on? To, to, if I see the sick, do I have to be told to, to minister to them? No. Do I always do it? No. You know, you, you get in condemnation over it? Nope. Why? There's those that I do. There's those that I don't. There's well, as I go about, I minister. I do whatever I need to do. But at the same time, I don't get into condemnation over it. Why? Because I'm trying to help people. But you have to realize, when I first started, I'd go to Walmart and I'd be there to, to shop. You know, to, to actually go in and get some things. And in the middle of it, I would see sick people or whatever else, and I would think, okay, I, I'll get them for it. I'm trying to get this list done or whatever it is, and I'll catch them before I leave. And then I got under heavy condemnation because I missed that one. I missed this one. Didn't do that. And it, it became a burden, and it became condemnation. And so I went to God and said, what about those that I miss? He said, I'm telling you. He said, I have foreordained good works that you're supposed to walk in, and you get rewarded for it. And he said, it's just rewards you don't get. That person's still hurting. He said, but don't think you're the only one I can get to talk to them. And there was because my big thing, I know this may sound silly, but my big thing when I first started and realized that who I put my hands on gets well and who I didn't, they don't. My my big thing was, God, you know, I don't really care for Target. What if that sick person that you want me to pray for is in Target and I'm over at Walmart and I don't hear your voice to tell me to go to Target? What if I'm disobedient and I go to Walmart? You know, and God said, guess what? I'm big enough to either get you there or them to you or get somebody to them. Don't worry about it. Go about just live life. Yeah. And as you go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast as you go. Right? And you, now listen, you can pick. Uh, this is the big question people have. You mean we, have to, we can actually choose to get up and just go out and pray for the sick? That, these are some of the questions I got in uh, Henderson in, 
outside Vegas recently. You mean we can actually, we can just get up and go pray for people anytime we want to? We don't have to wait until we're, we're led to go? I said, no. You're told to do it. You can just decide. Today, we're going to go pray for the sick at, you know, fill in the blank. And you can just get up and go. And, and there were several people there that were shocked at that. And it opened up their world. And as soon as we got done that day, they went out and started praying for the sick. It just launched them. Believe me, believe it or not, there are groups out there that are, that are so controlled by fear that they, they think they have to just sit and wait until, you know, it thunders to hear God's voice. And I'm telling you, you are free to help and to do what is right and what is good. You are free, right? Galatians says that we are to, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, all these things. He said, there, against such there is no law. In other words, you can do all the love, joy, peace there that you can put out to people. And there's no law against it. Well, when you go out and lay hands on the sick, that is you're having love for your neighbor as you would for yourself. And you can do that all you want. You can do it any time you want. You don't have to be led. Now, I will give you the secret. When you're doing that, just so you know, you're being led. You just don't know you're being led. right? Because it's his nature in you, both to will and to do of his good will. Amen? So even that desire... And that's why I guess it gets me more than anything else is when people say, well, I want to go do this, but, you know, I just don't know if it's me or if it's God. I want to go do it, but, you know, I don't want to do something that's out of God's will. I thought, do you really think you're more merciful than God? You want to do it and God doesn't want you to? Where do you think that mercy comes from in the first place? That comes from God. And these are things that have kept the church in so much bondage. And that, that's why many times, I, I, I don't know why, but this is why, or this is what God bring, you know, leads us to bring it out. It's what comes out of things because people need to be free to help people. And God is against bondage. He's against oppression. And I, I don't know of any bondage greater than for God to give absolute power to the church and then for man-made traditions to keep people that have the power of God within them bound up out of fear that they can't reach out and touch lives. See, it's one thing for me to, you know, if I, if I it'd be an easy thing to come in and just preach to somebody and say, oh, don't move unless God tells you to, because there's some people that don't want to move. They don't want to do nothing. You know, it just, they're just waiting for their, you know, <laughs> ticker to quit ticking so they can get out of here. And they're just trying to make sure their card's punched, as we'd say, and they don't want to do anything for God. But then you've got other people they really want to do and See, that's one thing. If you don't want to do anything for God, that's, that's between you and God. You know, I, I don't agree with it, but I don't understand it. But that's between you and God. But what really, I, I really believe grieves the Spirit of God is to have a church with people in it that want to do something for God, want to touch lives and want to help people, and they're in bondage to where they think, I can't move until God tells me to, and I can't move until I get a special leading. To me, that's the worst kind of bondage because... It's, it's one thing to have people that don't want to do anything. But it's another thing to have a group of people that want to do something, but don't feel they can. To me, that's the biggest waste. You know, it, it's a failure to try. You know, most of the great things that are done in this world are done by the people who are not talented enough to do them. Why? Because the people that are talented to do them sit and do nothing. And yet it's the other people that feel, I ain't got no talents at all, but I'll, <laughs> I'll go for it. And they're the ones that actually accomplish something. So there comes a point where, you know, if you got that desire in you, step out. You know, you say, well, whatever it is you do or you don't do or you can't, most things you get better at with practice. You know, and you may not start out real good, but at some point you'll get better generally. And if you don't, there'll always be somebody to tell you you're not getting any better. Right? That, believe me, they will always be around to tell you, okay, that's enough. All right? So, now, but it says, <clears throat> how be it? John sixteen thirteen, when he the Spirit of Truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's the key. I really wanted to emphasize that to you. Now, the thought in the original Greek here for being filled, or as, as we were talking about being led by the Spirit, is that of being influenced by something to the point of action. And so, I'm going to look at one verse. People say, "Well, what about you know Jesus was led?" So, okay, well, let's read that. Okay, Matthew. There's really only one place where it says Jesus was led, and that's in Matthew chapter four. We're going to look at that real quick here. Matthew chapter 4, the thought, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. 
Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, people say, well, yeah, but Jesus was led. Yeah, okay, but you don't want that leading. Right? He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? Now, number one, note it. This is what amazed me. Jesus had to be led by the Spirit out to the wilderness to be tempted. That right there, just that thought. That he had to be led out to be tempted. That right there just is amazing to me. I mean, come on. We really don't need to be led into temptation. We find our own way. Right? We don't need any help getting there. We find our own way there. Usually temptation, you know, <laughs> it's right there. Right? So it's not a matter of us having to be led. But he had to be led out in the wilderness just to be tempted. And, of course, he overcame that temptation. Usually the temptations that we find our way into, we don't overcome. And you know, it's like the sticker I always see everywhere it goes. And it's like, you know, I can, I, I can overcome anything but temptation. You know, okay. That, if you have that at your home, you should destroy it. Right? Your faith overcomes everything. Amen? Your faith can overcome everything. That's why I tell you, I don't get the, I don't get the big deal about living right. It is not that hard to do what's right. It is not that hard. Especially if you have truly been born again, it is not that hard to just live right. Right? It's not, a, if, now listen, if you're still struggling with stuff, you need to kill it. Maybe it's because you're playing with it and you hadn't killed it. You need to kill that thing once and for all. The best way to kill temptation is honestly just to make a public fool of yourself. Right? That's the easiest way to do it. Go, if you have a problem going somewhere where you shouldn't go, the easiest way to solve that is the next time you go there, when you get there, you stand up and just preach for about five minutes real loud. You'll probably never go back there again. Just telling you that's, way, that's a good way to kill it. Right? So whatever it takes you to kill that, you need to kill it. But most people just don't want to do that. Why? Because they want to be too respectable. And they want to fit in. And most people want to keep it where they can say, well, I want to go back there sometime if I ever decide to. Nope. Get away from Jordan. Cross over in the promised land. Live there. Get as far from Jordan and the wilderness of sin as you can get. All right? Now, he says, here, he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after, afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God. Now notice, his temptation was, If thou be the Son of God. Now he knew who he was. But imagine this. See, even this idea that G this was a... This was a temptation. If it wasn't, then it wasn't real, and he wasn't tempted, which the Bible says he was tempted. And it says in Hebrews that he was tempted in all ways just as we were, right? So if this is not a real temptation, then he wasn't tempted like us. So he was really tempted to doubt whether he was the Son of God. Think about that. But now look how he responded. He said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. How did he beat the devil? It is written. That's the best number one way to beat the devil. It is written. Why? That's why the word is called the sword of the spirit. That's the way to fight. Every time. It is written. Now, if you don't know it's written, it's kind of hard to quote. It is written. So one key is to start reading the Bible more. Get the Bible into you so you, so you will know it is written. Right? Matter of fact, if you spend more time reading the Bible, you've got less time to go do the things you shouldn't do. Right? So it just works. Nine level chess. It's like I'm telling you. Nine level chess. All right? I don't know where that came from today, but that's, that's probably what we'd have to call the message, nine-level chess. No, I don't know. But anyway, he says, then, uh, in verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and sits him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God. You notice, every one of these temptations pretty much go the same way. If thou be the Son of God. If it, and he always tried to get him to act. Notice, and again, you have to realize, temptation is only temptation until you act. When you act, it's no longer temptation, then it's sin. You got that? So that's why doubt is such a big deal. Most times people, it says if you believe and doubt not, and most people think that as soon as they have a bad thought of what if it doesn't happen, that that is the, the, the doubt, and therefore you have sinned. Nope, the doubt is not the sin. Doubt is temptation to sin. Do you get that? Doubt is the temptation to sin. When, when Satan tries to tempt you, he gives you a thought that doubts some part of God's word. And as long as it's just a thought, 
and you don't act on it, it's just a temptation. But the minute you act on it, now it becomes the sin. Now you've backed into the sin. So when you, as I've said before, you start to lay hands on the sick and you, you, you see them across, you walk toward them. Before you get to them, you're going to have that thought, what if it doesn't happen? You think, oh, now I've doubted, so I might as well not even try. No, you've not yet doubted. You've not yet doubted it. You, that is a temptation to doubt. At some point, now you have to decide, right then you just freeze and say, okay, do I move forward or do I back off? If you back off, guess what? Now you've doubted. Now you have actually sinned, right? You've bit the temptation. Or you can go, no, I'm thinking go heal this person. That thought is not me, and it's not God. So I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to do what God said. Now you move into faith, and even you moving forward, actually you grow even moving forward before you even lay hands on the sick. So it's a good opportunity for growth if you move forward. So then he said in verse 6, He said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, do you realize the devil's quoting the Bible? He'll do that a lot, right? He will quote the Bible and gener- Okay, what we call tradi- traditions of men or sacred cows is usually the devil quoting the Bible to somebody. Almost every time... If Okay, the big traditions of men against healing is Paul's thorn, Job, Timothy's stomach, Jesus couldn't heal all in his own hometown, right? Paul left somebody sick somewhere. He doesn't know who or when or what, but they, they know. Do you realize all those came out of the Bible? But they're misread? You see, the devil will quote those things wrong to people, build them up, and like anything else, Hitler learned, if you say a lie long enough, people believe it. Well, some of our politicians have learned that same tactic, right? If you lie long enough, people will believe it. And it's the same thing. The devil said, you know what? If I keep saying the same old lie long enough, people will, have, will adopt it. Why? Because it usually takes pressure off of somebody to do what the Bible says. It usually gives them an excuse to avoid responsibility. So, he says in verse, where are we at there? Yeah, in verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him all these things will I give thee if you will fall down and worship me notice every one of these um, temptations again had an action that the devil was trying to get Jesus to do why? because faith is an action and so is doubt you got it? doubt is an action it's not a thought remember that doubt is an action faith is an action Fear is an action. Doubt is a form of fear. And so anytime there, anytime there is a temptation, there will always be an action associated with it. And he said, if you will fall down and worship me. Now, in, yeah, in verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You notice when the angel showed up? After the fight. You get that? See, usually in the fight, okay, when he gets down to it, use some uh, fight terminology, right? You've got trainers, you've got coaches, you've got all these people in the fight business. You know, like the UFC and all that kind of stuff. Boxers, a whole bit. But when the bell rings, there's only, well, technically three people in the ring. Usually you've got two fighters and a referee. And whenever whoever wins there, they can't blame their trainers. They can't blame their coach. Who wins and who loses comes down to what that person in the ring did. So whenever you're in the middle of temptation, that is the fight. And you can't blame this person, that person. When it comes down to temptation, nobody can make you sin. That is your own choice. That is your choice. It, now, they may push you. They may know all the buttons to push. They may know everything to do. But it comes down to it that you have to do some kind of action. You have to make some kind of choice to move into sin. And no matter what that person's doing, and you have to realize, my coach is better than their coach. And my coach taught me how to not react. Now, again, 
You know, the, the, the beauty of Christianity is there's always forgiveness. Amen? You mess up, you get up. You fall down seven, you get up eight. Isn't that right? It's what, what the Bible says very clearly. A righteous man, though he falls down seven times, he will arise eight. So it's not, it, it's amazing to me, we talked about this on the trip recently, that um, it doesn't say that a righteous man never falls. It says a righteous man falls seven times and gets up eight. In other words, he always gets up one more time than he falls. Right? So the key is, as soon as you fall, get back up. That's one of the first things that they teach you, even in fighting, especially in grappling. You get pinned, you get out, you get away. You get up. Get up and get away from the thing. Don't fight their fight. Fight your fight. Amen? If the devil can get you into the carnal realm, he will beat you. He tries to get us into the flesh, we got to stay in the spirit. If we stay in the spirit, we can beat him every time. When we, when if he can draw us out and get us into the natural carnal realm, he will beat us every time he does. So the key is not getting in the flesh, staying in the spirit, walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, because the devil doesn't even care about whatever he's trying to get you to do. That's not the point. The point is to make you ineffective for the kingdom of God. That's his whole point. He could care less about you. He could care less about whatever sin he's trying to get you to get. He's not trying to reward you at all. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with him trying to trap you, get you into bondage to sin, and trying to get you ineffective for the kingdom of God. That's the purpose of temptation for us. Now, finally, move on over. Uh, I will say that this experience with Jesus was a very unique experience because he had to... Uh, overcome these temptations to be proven pure and worthy to be Savior and Lord. So there was a purpose for that. Now, and you'll notice here too, this started before his public ministry, basically. He got baptized, bam, came out, Holy Spirit came upon him, and he went right out, and immediately the temptation started. Immediately. The devil didn't wait until he had some victories. The, the devil attacked him immediately before any victories. Amen? Yeah. Notice the last part here, and we're going to finish up with this here. <laughs> Got a good set of lungs there, isn't it? Amen. Be a preacher. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I want to go to, uh, let's see, go to Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> babies crying have never bothered me. I, uh, I can appreciate a baby's cry. Amen. <laughs> Of course, I'm a grandfather now. I don't have any little babies that live in my house. It's another reason probably why they don't bother me because I can hand them back to the parents and they can take them away. So, <laughs> either way. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, yes. Acts chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 4. Whoop. Something fell back there. Acts chapter 16, verse 4. And as they went through the cities... They delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, watch this, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now that is a, a whole study. You ought to get in there if you don't get a chance to study it we're going to take that apart sometime and really go into it because that is an amazing study and especially if you look at history and the way things went through history there were specific things for this so um, it's just amazing anyway verse 7 after they were come to Mysia they essayed to go into Bithynia but the spirit suffered them not and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night there stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, well, verse 10, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now notice, notice what they're doing. They did not sit in Jerusalem until they got a vision of where to go. They were going. They were going out, and as they went, now notice, it said, and Paul even said several times, he wrote to him and said, uh, I've wanted to come to you, but, you know, I've been prevented coming to you so, you know, up to this time. So there's situations going on where 
here they're moving forward. What is Paul doing? He's doing the Great Commission. He's going into all the world. Right here, you can look. They'd gone through Phrygia, gone to Galatia, region of Galatia. <clears throat> they were heading toward Asia, but God didn't let them get there. It didn't tell any details of what was going there, and it didn't say anything. They said they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to go there. It didn't give you any details of what that meant. But if you, again, later we will look at that, and I will bring out some points of how they knew that, but it wasn't by a vision or a specific word or even a prophecy. We'll talk about that later on. But look, then it says, after they were coming to Mysia. So they're still going. He's going to the Great Commission. It's almost he's trying to find his way of where he's going, but he's going into all the world. So he's doing the Great Commission, and, and yet we know it says they assayed or meant or were planning on going into Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't let them do that either. So they kept trying these things to go into certain areas, and it just didn't work out through different reasons. Again, I will explain it. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So now they're trying. They're moving forward. And then Paul gets a vision. But now notice it was only Paul that got the vision. Everybody else in his crew didn't get it. So they had to go by Paul's vision. Paul had to come tell them what he saw in the vision. And they said, wow, okay, well then we take that to mean go over here to Macedonia. But notice what he said. Notice what he saw. He didn't have a word from God. You get that? He didn't have a word from God. God didn't show up and say, Paul, I want you to go to Macedonia. He didn't have a prophet show up and say, Thus saith the Lord, Paul, go to Macedonia. None of that happened. He had a vision in the night. And in that vision, he saw a man of Macedonia, which apparently probably knew him by how he was dressed. But he had a man in Macedonia. So, now get this. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So what Paul sees is a man praying. Right? Right? And saying, come over to heaven. Psalm 32. I will guide you with my eye. I will let you see what I see. What was God seeing? A man of Macedonia saying, God, we need help. And what did Paul say? That's a man of Macedonia. We got to go help him. So what did God do? He just said, here, Paul, look what I see. What do you see there? What are you going to do? And what did they do? They went there to preach the gospel. Into Greece, basically. Do you see... It wasn't by a word. It wasn't, Paul didn't have an, an inner witness or anything else. But now notice, the main thing is, Paul is moving on the Great Commission. He's just doing what he's supposed to do. And in the middle of that, he's going, and he keeps, you know, hitting what we would call dead ends. We've had that even in the ministry. There's places that I have wanted to go. And places where we would look at going, and it's like, it just doesn't work out. And, you know, Australia has been one of those things that it just constantly everything seems like under the sun comes up to try to keep us from going to Australia. And, and we've gone there four or five times now, I guess, maybe more, and we've got a good work started there, but it is such a fight to get there every time we try to go. Something tries to come up to stop us, and it has stopped us at least twice of going, at least twice, maybe even three times. And we've been there four, so that's seven or eight different trips that we plan on going there. But at the same time, I'm just going to say there are times... When, there's times whenever you go to places and you kind of run into things and sometimes it's the devil that seems to be stopping you. Other times God's saying, no, i got something I need you to do here. There have been times, uh, for instance, when we were going to the UK uh, last year. We were going to go up and we got on a plane. I mean, we were sitting and it, I knew. Now, see, here's the, here's the, the hard part. You want to know what ministry is like today? You can't just jump on a plane and go anywhere. It takes months in advance, and especially if you don't want to spend an exorbitant amount of money on tickets. And me, I'm pretty cheap, so I try to get tickets in advance. Well, you, we, we had these things scheduled, but now you have to plan so far in advance. And even whenever, the general way I look at things, I'll say, okay, I'm going to go there. And then I will, for lack of a better term, I'll see how it feels, you know. Because it's not a matter of whether I go, it's a matter of when I go. That's the key. Because I, I go into all the world, and I'm going to go into all the world at some point. It's just a matter of when and how to work it out and work out that schedule. And there are times whenever I have bought tickets, wanted to go, wanted to go, and it seemed like fought against it, knew not to buy the tickets, did anyway, and then we start to go, something happens where I end up not been able to go. Uh, the trip to the, to the UK was like that. We were supposed to go in, 
we got up to um, Chicago, and all the planes were grounded. I mean, it was ridiculous, and and it wasn't weather. At first, they were saying it was a weather storm, weather pattern somewhere else, and that wasn't it. Come to find out later on, there were some serious uh, threats uh, against U.S. planes going into certain areas and coming from certain areas. And so we got grounded there in Chicago for two days, and finally, I went and called the, the airlines and said, you know, next plane back to Dallas. Just put us on the next plane back to Dallas. And as soon as we got on that plane, came back to Dallas right after that, then shortly after that, everything got lifted. But it was, and then we come to find out there was no word of a terroristic threat or anything like that at that point. Nobody would say anything about it. But later on, we found out you don't always hear a thing from the news here. But if you can tap into news in other countries and listen to their news, you find out a lot more details, a lot more things that are going on, especially with the United States. So uh, various news agencies are very controlled. Uh, whether, whether we talk about censorship or not, it's there. And so. There have been those situations when I was in Trinidad. I went to Trinidad a couple of years ago, and the same thing happened there where we were grounded, and I, I just happened to meet uh, one of the head guys for American Airlines that was there in the terminal with me, and they had some very tangible threats against certain planes. They had found some people that had uh, maps and diagrams of flight plans and times and things like that, and they were planning on shooting them down with a, a um, one-man... Uh, basically a uh, surface air missile and so a stinger exactly yeah and so they were going to try to take the plane down so we got grounded there so these situations take place and sometimes you look at them and you have to realize okay is this God telling me go here instead of there or is this the devil trying to keep me from getting there and that's where it comes in where you have to know and be able to, to, to discern the mind and will of God and you say well how, how do you do that well generally Honestly, in most people's lives, you don't have to deal with that a whole lot. Right? Now, the more involved you are in actually bringing the gospel to other nations and to different people, the more that comes up. Because there are certain things that were to go. Here in America, most of the time, you can get pretty much anywhere you need to get. Right? One way or another. Fly, drive, something. You can get there. But um, I, I can see very easily in the near future where that might not even be uh, as available as we would like to see it just because of the way certain things are going and so there comes a time when you have to realize we are called by God to go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature and when I try to go places now this is the same way with, with healing if the enemy attacks me usually the first thing I do is I'll pray for myself command it to go lay hands on myself whatever I need to do to get it done if it stays longer or if it attacks somebody in my family to, to stay longer like that, that's when I usually start going after the devil and say, okay, every minute you stay, I'm going to go find five people to pray for. In other words, I turn it against him and, and I make it to, to God's advantage. And so usually as soon as we start doing that, he leaves pretty quick after that. Generally, that's the way it works. It's the same thing if, if I am hindered from going somewhere on a trip I'm not going to sit and twiddle my thumbs. I will immediately start finding another outlet. And usually something opens up real quick that makes a big strategic um, advantage for the kingdom of God. So I'm not going to let... Whether, and usually, if the devil is trying to keep me out of somewhere, then I turn it to God's advantage. It, many times, I believe it was God saying, no, I want you to do this instead. Right? Because, honestly, if you think about it, like in my position, doing what we do, I have to be perfectly led by the Spirit on which invitation is to take, buy tickets, get everything arranged, get all that stuff, and I have to be perfectly led six months in advance. Right? It's not just a day. It's six months in advance. And so if you miss it, one thing there, everything gets out of whack. And so, But God being God, He can fix it. Amen? Big thing is, I don't get, as we'd say, bent out of shape over it. We, we just keep on walking with God. We keep doing what we do. And whatever, wherever we are, we're going to be a blessing to the people. We're going to advance the kingdom of God. And we're going to do as much damage to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of darkness, as we can. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's all stand up. Now, as we do this, we, and I don't have the information handy, but I can get it. But uh, we have a person 
that is um, very vital to our ministry. And she's been a great help to us and has worked with our with the forum and our website and coordinating things. I mean, it's been amazing. Uh, I think she lives on the Internet. I mean, anything happening on the Internet, she knows what's going on, all right? And she contacts us, says, this is happening, that happened, and just on top of it. And honestly, we there is no way we could have done what we have done so far without her. And today, or actually tomorrow, is her birthday. And she's always watching by Internet on these broadcasts. So I just want everybody to say happy birthday to Deborah. Happy birthday, Deborah. Uh, God bless you. Amen. All right. She's always been a real blessing to us, and so we just wanted to wish her another happy birthday and many more to come, and we just really want to, to thank her for being the blessing to us that she has been. So um, now I'm going to pray. We're going to do a general prayer first, and then my daughter's going to come up here for a second. So we're going to pray first. So right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these people. I, Father, these are your people, and I thank you for them, that they are here, that they are listening to your word. And I thank you right now, Father, that according to your word, they were healed 2,000 years ago. And, and so right now, in Jesus' name, right now, we break everything that is coming against them. Every sickness and disease, any ailments and pains, whether it's acute or chronic, right now, in the name of Jesus, we break it and we command life. We command life throughout their bodies spirit, soul, and body. We command absolute healing, total freedom in accordance with your will, God, right now, which is that they be completely healed, whole, delivered, free. Father, we thank you for it. And right now, in Jesus' name, right now, those that are here, those that are listening by internet, those that are listening by CD or DVD, we say in Jesus' name right now, you be free, you be healed, you be whole now. In Jesus' name, I set you free. And right now, in Jesus' name, we release and say, even now, in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Spirit in fullness to overflowing with a release of being able to speak in other tongues as the Spirit speaks through you. And I say right now, for the Holy Spirit to just flood the people of God, flood to overflowing, to strengthen, to encourage, to build up in their most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, glorifying God. So, Father, we thank you right now to receive, in Jesus' name, complete freedom, fullness, filling of the Spirit, baptism of the Spirit, overflowing in Jesus' name. And right now, in Jesus' name, I know I'm using that name a lot, but I want you to realize how powerful that name is, that right now, if you are in the sound of my voice and doctors have told you that your situation is terminal or that it's permanent or that it will you just have to live with it the rest of your life I will tell you now they are wrong they do not know now they know what they're talking about when it comes to just from the natural facts but they don't know the spiritual facts and the spiritual facts is by the stripes of Jesus you were healed and set free Amen. and I'm telling you now right now we break that 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 curse of being told that your situation is terminal. Yes. Terminal is not a word in God's vocabulary. God's vocabulary is life, Hallelujah. health. Hallelujah. So even now, in Jesus' name, I set you free. In the name of Jesus, right now, be healed now in Jesus' name. And I set you free. So be it. So be it. Amen. Amen. Rebecca, come on up.